All right. All right. Hey there, folks. Since book tour and conventions are still somewhat on hold, I figured I'd bring book tour to you. So welcome to Russ's Rock and Roller Coaster Season 4, Intriguing Interviews with Creative Minds. With us tonight is my friend Linda Rollins, a writer of cozy mysteries, including her Misty Point Mystery and Rocky Meadow Mystery Series. Say that three times fast. She's an acting member of Mystery Writers of America and recently completed her time as president of the Central Jersey Chapter of Sisters in Crime, the Writers Association dedicated to crime and mystery fiction. Welcome, Linda. Hi, Russ. How are you? Okay. Thanks for having me. Oh, sure thing. Glad to do it. All right. So just a heads up to the folks at home. Feel free to send me notes or questions you have for me or Linda in the chat box during the show, and we'll get to a few at the end. Okay. As we always do, we'll start at the beginning. Uh, so where were you born? Where'd you grow up? <sighs> So I was born in New Jersey. I was born in North New Jersey. Um, basically, I grew up in Fairfield, New Jersey. So I'm in Essex County, North Jersey. So I've been here, went to, to school here, came back here to practice, opened my practice as a physician here. All right, so hold on. So we're, we're, we're jumping around a little too much. So let's, well, you're, you're skipping ahead of all the good stuff. All right, so I'm, I'm a tra uh, transplanted New Yorker now in New Jersey for about eight years. But when I was a kid, New Jersey was sort of New York's ugly loser stepsister. What was the attitude among the Jersey crew when it came to New York? Well, um, that's a little bit hard question because I have a brother who lives in New York. So when you're talking about upper state New York versus the city, uh -huh. you have different attitudes. So uh, New Jersey, yes, everybody would always try to get into the city because that's where all the excitement and the lights and the brights were. Um, I personally am more of a nature person, so I would like to go up toward New York and Vermont and those places, uh, kind of get away from that. Okay, fair enough. So like, I have to ask, all right, as a Jersey girl, are you a diehard Springsteen and Bon Jovi fan? You know, I'm more Bon Jovi. I have to tell you, I'm more okay. Bon Jovi than Springsteen, but I do mention both of them in my books. Um, especially, you know, my first one, I'm talking about a character who wants to be a Springsteen Bon Jovi, but personally... I'm a Bon Jovi girl. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're, so I'm, I'm assuming, was, your, was your hair really puffed out? Well, I wasn't quite the 80s puff, but yeah. Yeah. I had the, you know, the, the puffy long blonde. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So when, uh, so are, do you have uh, brothers, sisters, or was it just you? Uh, actually, I have two brothers. I have an older brother and I have a younger brother that I like to tell everyone is also older than me, but uh, <laughs> I have two brothers. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I'm sorry. So you were the middle kid. So what, what was that like? Did you guys get along? Well, uh, I have to tell you that uh, I would always pick on my brothers and my father never allowed them to, you know, take revenge or do anything. So I kind of beat them up all the time and they couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> Oh, get away with a murder, huh? All right. Yeah. So, so um, what about your what about your folks? Were they um, what did they do? Well, my father actually had a recording studio, so it was interesting because when I was young, he would record people, and I I met all sorts of people. Um, some Yankees would come; they would record commercials. I met some groups. I met a lot of country singers when I was young. I mean, starting when I was eight, ten years old. So. Um, that kind of was very interesting, very interesting to meet a lot of people and see their take on the world, get to know them during their performance, but then also to know how they were when they were off stage. Wait, so, you know? so hang on a second. So this recording studio, was this a home studio? Did he have a, a separate site? A little bit of both. So, so country singers during concerts, like for instance, when I was young, I met Crystal, Girl, Crystal Gale. Wow, wow. Um, you know, I met... Um, he did a commercial with a Yankee catcher and, you know, I got to watch them doing the Wait, commercial. Thurman Munson? No, 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 not Thurman oh. Munson. No, no, no. I think it was Rick Cerrone. Rick Cerrone. Oh boy. Yeah. I oh. mean, I'm dating myself by giving you these, these names and all, but uh, so that's what he did. So early on, there was a lot of um, artistic stuff going on. You know, I played guitar and so there was, I would sneak in there and do some singing in the studio and things did like that. Did you really? That. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Really? Do you, I, still, do you I, still play? I do still play. I, um, a little bit though, just for myself, but yeah. uh, there was a trip to Nashville where, um, you know, went on to a couple of stages just for, you know, not, not in any real time, but uh, got to play a little bit on stage just to see what it would feel like. It was kind oh. of neat. Whoa, 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 hold on. Hold on a second. So how old were you at the, at, when you, when you did this? 
Oh, well, my father, I started watching things probably when I was about 10 or 12, but uh, I had my children when I went to Nashville. That was kind of a vacation we took together just to, to make the tour and to go visit, you know, and see how it was. So um, I had my kids a little bit late because I went through medical school first. So got there, I was maybe around 30. So wait, so are you, are you a country fan? Is that what you were singing down there? Yes, country music, but I have to tell you, books and music, I'm kind of all over the place. I like to listen to all sorts of genres, you know, and what I listened to in the 80s has certainly evolved and is different than what I listen to now. But, you know, I like to look big variety, but that's what I would sing is mostly country type songs. So, Absolutely. So when your dad was doing the recording, was he just a sound technician? Was he an engineer? Like what, why did he have a student? What was the business? He was an engineer. He was an engineer. Everybody a lot of people in my family are engineers um, and um, work, for instance, with um, I don't, IBM and things like that. A lot of engineers in the family. So, but um, I guess I don't know exactly, you know, the, the, the makeup other than that, but had the studio and then people would come in, record. There'd be a lot of editing and things like that. So it was kind of a neat exposure. Yeah. So, who, so who, who else did you get a chance to? So you, you met, you saw some of these folks in the studio, but then afterwards, like who, who else did you? Who else did you get a chance to know a little bit? There was a band he recorded called the Good Rats. Dude, I don't know if you ever heard of them. No. And it depended if he was doing music or if he was doing um, video, because there was a little bit at that time. It wasn't really video. It was more audio commercials that he was doing. So and back then in the 80s, you know, they would do audio commercials for malls if they were opening up or things along those lines. Or he would have people that were narrating um, scripts for malls, you know, remember walking through a mall and they would have like a Christmas show and somebody narrating things, you know, things like that. Huh. So, yeah, huh. that, that's really pulling from my memory, but, uh, yeah. So did that so I actually, I didn't, you know, stay there for long, but I actually stood on the stage of Nash Nashville palace and sang. <laughs> How many songs did you get to sing? Oh, only a couple. I mean, it was, that was the type of a casual night type of thing, but, um, my husband and I were up there. My husband, that's how we met. We both played music. And that's one of the ways, you know, one of the things that uh, linked us together when we met. Wait, your husband, yeah. play, your husband plays too? Yes, my husband plays guitar. My husband plays piano. My kids play music. Um, very, very involved in music and all grow So do you guys just did home? Do you guys just like sit around and say, let's, all right, let's break out the instruments and play together? We used to. <laughs> we used to do that a lot. I mean, the kids are grown now and... Um, you know, they're, they have their own kids, but yeah, we used to sing a lot. As a matter of fact, one of the things we did was sing at church. And there was a time where we had four generations on the altar singing together. Is that right? So, yep. Yeah. Wow. So that was something together is that every uh, weekend we would all go to church together. And then as soon as we were done with mass, we'd get in the car and we'd hit the beach. So <laughs> funny. So, so, so when it was four generations, so it was what your sort of like your great grandmother yeah, even even now we still have four generations. My mom, us, my kids, and uh, I have and my grandchildren are too young, obviously, to do anything. But we still have four generations going on. Isn't that some? Huh. Wow. That's that's a true. little bit. Now, when, were your kids? Were they? Did you and your husband teach them music, or were, did they you know learn that from school? Like, how did that happen? Well, part of it was school. Um, they had the required instruments and band. My son worked a lot with my father. So he learned a lot of the tricks of the trade of video and whatnot. And uh, actually today is now like a national social media manager and uh, is very involved in video. Went to college, you know, to do, do a lot of that. So um, that's part of what he does um, professionally. So he does that. My daughter also, um, my daughter, lovely, lovely singing voice. She um, actually in school was playing violin, but what happened was we, she was involved as the singer for the jazz band and won many awards actually for that. Oh, that's as, cool. Uh, their singer. And my son then married um, a woman who is a music therapist, a certified music therapist. So we're back with the medicine now. We're the same thing through music therapy is helping a lot of patients and doing a lot like that. Okay, so, so, so let me ask you, um, so when you were a kid, so obviously you played music, but what, what else kept you busy? Well, school, a lot of school work, constantly doing school, constantly um, studying, and I always had a part-time job. 
Uh, when my husband and I started dating, uh, it was of the true variety where we would just love to go to bookstores, you know, you know, the old, the old meme, you know, instead of buying me a drink, go and buy me a book, you know, bring me to a bookstore. So we did, we, we shared a love of reading. What a love, are, what of, love read? of art. Back then, oh, so in school, I would read a lot of, um, I would read a lot of Tolkien and whatnot. Probably by the time we started dating, I was doing a lot of Stephen King. Mm -hmm. um, started reading a lot of Stephen King and some of, you know, that type of genre. I, I did not read cozies at that point. Um, but to be honest, when I was very young, you know, about 10, I was reading a lot of my grandmother's work by like Phyllis Whitney and things like that. So I would start there, but I read everything. My husband had a major, you're going to love this. He had a major, major love for Star Trek. So we had every Star Trek book, right. every one. Really? Um, so we went through sci-fi, we went through horror, we went through fantasy, you know, that type of thing. We just, even to this day, you know, constantly read. I mean, nowadays I like to read, you know, mainstream. So I'm reading a lot of Patterson or I read a lot of Jantz or Harlan Coben, who's mm -hmm. in, you know, our area here. So yeah. um, I just, I actually try to mix it up constantly. So when, and, you, when you were reading Star Trek, who are your favorite authors? Do you remember? I don't remember. Okay. I, I don't remember. I know we collected the series and I would, you know, birthdays and Christmases, I'd be like, okay, we got volumes 12 through 50 now and whatnot. I, I honestly don't remember the specific authors of the sci-fi. I, I can't tell you that. I'm sorry. Okay. That's okay. It's okay. So listen, so you spend your time professionally working in healthcare, but how did you get into that? Actually, I, I blame it on my husband. It's his fault because, uh, we were in college together and, um, I really always liked to educate and I had probably thoughts about becoming a teacher and he was on his way to medical school and talked me into it. So uh, we did, we wound up taking the boards together. We both were accepted into the same medical school together and uh, went through the program that way. And it's interesting if I can just take it a minute because in medicine, as part of what we do, we're constantly educating patients about you know, their disease or diagnosis or treatment. So you're still doing education, but through a different perspective. So, and you still solve mysteries because somebody will come in with a symptom and through whatever means, history, physical diagnoses, you're still solving a mystery. So uh, it's sort of the same thing, but in a different field. So you, have, that... so you have an MD? Yes. Yes, MD, DO. Yes, they're, they're the same. Mm -hmm. And so I have to, so I have friends who work in hospitals and clinics and other healthcare facilities who've told me all sorts of stories about working during the height of the pandemic. Um, what, yeah. was that, what was that like for you? Horrible, horrible. Um, so I'm in a position now because I've been in medicine for 30 something years that I'm considered a clinical director who's somebody who oversees the medical directors and the nurses. So I work more on interpreting the regs, you know, for the staff, making sure quality. So it was a little bit difficult because with COVID, you working, as you know, you're working in a hospital, a system in a network, in a network. So what happens is that, that um, the CDC was changing their guidance every 30 to, you know, every 30 days in the beginning, it seemed. Um, there was a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. There was a lot of scrambling in the beginning until everybody really got to know. And, you know, a lot of people have a lot of opinions, but I feel like everybody should be walking through an ICU at one point in time and, and seeing patients on these ventilators and in these situations. And they probably might have a little bit difference of opinion once they're actually dealing with that. You know, a lot of fear. I, some of my colleagues, I... I'm so amazed and proud and blessed. They were some of the most fearless people who just went right in there and did what they had to do to save these patients. And it was so impressive, I have to tell you. So the gamut of emotions ran from anxiety and fear all the way through just amazement at you know how well how well people just you know selfishly threw themselves into whatever to try to do whatever they could. Well, I, 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 I'll, I'll speak for me, but I know many other people feel the same, but I, I have to say that the work that you did and anyone who was on the front lines of healthcare during that time, I mean, you guys should just get, you should get like the medal of honor for, for really just doing, if it wasn't for you guys, the rest of us would be done. So 
my from me i'll just speak for me uh my my eternal gratitude for for your efforts during what's, uh, what was really horrible yeah thank you but it, and, it, and it's not just healthcare. the police the fire department sure. oh, I, and i mean that for every uh, for, for everyone who was on the front lines i also have spoken amazing. to police amazing. officers emts but that's got to be so let me ask so just speaking on the ventilators i mean at least from the what everything I've read is that it turned out ultimately that the ventilators were not really the answer. Is, is that right or not right? It, it It's so variable and it depends on case to case. It right. really does. You know, we can't say that at all. I mean, there's people that if they weren't on those vents, they wouldn't, some wouldn't have survived. Some didn't survive. Yeah. I have a, I have a friend of mine who's about my age who um, was on a ventilator for about six weeks. Yeah. Um, and, ba and barely made it. So what? So we were talking just a little bit before we started. So what are you seeing? Tell me what you're seeing now. Well, you know, of course, what they are trying to encourage is for everyone to get vaccinated. You constantly have mutations and viruses, and now we have the Delta variant, which is becoming, or if not already, the the dominant variant in the United States. And um, we have a Lambda variant that's now also coming. And um, you know, our hospitals are not as full, but what's happening is that. Um, very worried about most of the cases and of the major illness being in those that are not vaccinated. Right. So that's the concern. However, there are breakthrough cases of people that are vaccinated that are also getting sick. So, you know, still always holding that um, cautiousness, that edge of cautiousness, you should still always, if you can, you know, wear a mask or social distance or that type of thing. There, it, it's, it's not over and things are not 100% safe. So, right. So do, they're watching. Do you know, I mean, I don't know if there's enough data, but to the degree that you know these things, for those who have been vaccinated, but then got COVID, do you know if it's been across the board, regardless of which vaccine they got, or has it been that you could see, oh, well, the J&J, &J, it's more in the J&J &J or more in the Pfizer or more in the Moderna? Well, actually, it's funny because my husband and I were just uh, having this conversation earlier. Um, for the Delta variant, for instance, if you had Vi uh, Pfizer and Moderna, it looks as if you still have some pretty good protection toward uh, Delta, right. uh, where Pfizer might protect you 95% toward the original strains. Maybe you have about 88%. But uh, my husband was actually sharing some stats that it's different in different countries. For instance, in some countries, Scotland and whatnot, it might be a little lower. For some reason in Israel, the protection against Delta was only 66%. Mm. So you can't assume that you're safe because you were vaccinated. You definitely can't assume you're safe if you're not vaccinated. Um, and interestingly enough, the concern about the Delta, the standard, the standard philosophy was if you were next to somebody who was infected for 15 minutes unmasked, then there was a high risk of exposure. But Delta variant has shown that you can be exposed within mere minutes and masked or not, it is so virulent. Now, the question is if you're vaccinated, does that mean even if you catch it, maybe you will only have minor symptoms, but you won't die? You know, this is all data that they're collecting on a daily basis. So, um, you know, we'll know 10 years from now, they'll do much more of a study. And, right. and who knows with the Lambda variant, even what that's gonna be. So one, one last question on this and then we'll move on. I, I was reading somewhere or was listening somewhere that it's, and, and my information may not be accurate. I'd like to hear it from you is that in a large percentage of those who either died or got very ill is that on a large percentage of them that they were uh, ob there was obesity was a was a comorbidity is that accurate or not accurate well uh, i think the comorbidities that they were definitely looking at and that the state published is that people would have diabetes people who had coronary artery disease people who had other comorbid conditions certainly lent to them being more susceptible to some of the some of the problems the blood clots and the things that happen some of those patients, because of those conditions, are those that tend to be more overweight. Um, I, this, this is just a personal observation, and I don't really know that scientifically there's anything been done about it, but I've noticed that uh, it seems that patients with thick necks, right? Young, even younger firemen and people that were dying all seem to have the thick necks um, mm -hmm. as opposed to being obese. But when you saw all those pictures of everybody dying, I don't know. And that was just a personal observation. I don't know that there's necessarily any scientific basis on that. So I'm not going to say it's the obesity itself. I'm going to say it, you know, it's definitely the comorbid medical conditions right. 
very artery disease, diabetes, um, and obviously people who were immune suppressed for whatever reason, some of those conditions you find more often in people who are overweight. Uh, and that seems to be an issue. Right. Okay. All right. So let, let's, let's, let's move on from that. I know it's, it's, it's a lot. So, so let, let's, sh- let, let's shift over a bit. So, so you, you, like me, you do, you do words. So tell me when you first kind of got serious about writing. When I, well, it's funny because in fifth grade, so again, I was a voracious reader from the time I was small. And by fifth grade, I had read all the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drews and stuff like that. And I actually started writing a mystery series in fifth grade. And to this day, I wish, I don't know whatever happened to those pages. They probably got thrown out at the end of school year with everything else from the desk. But um, I was having a conversation, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago with a cardiologist friend of mine. And, you know, we had probably reached where we were going to be, you know, in our careers. And we wound up having this conversation about what would you do with the second half of your life if you now could start over? And I don't know why it was funny because I said, you know what, I would want to be a writer. I want to be a writer. And, you know, he told me about his dreams and um, I did. I, I, I guess in my mind, I always had things, you know, and then I, I started writing and, uh, and, and just started doing it, started writing my first book and so on. So that was, uh, I published that book in 2011 and now nine books later with the uh, number 10 on the way, you know, that's, that's when I first started getting serious. All right, so you focus primarily on cozy mysteries. So first, tell us what cozy mystery means and then what compels you to write them? Well, cozy mystery, generally, the the classic definition is where it's considered clean fiction. Uh, People die, things happen, but a lot of that is off the page. In other words, you're not visualizing the actual death. It's usually somebody is found that who's dead, you know? or there's romance involved, but there's not uh, explicit details of romance. So a lot of those things happen off the page. There's not a lot of cursing or things along those lines. Um, It's funny because um, in terms of there being a lot of intense emotion, I deal with that all day long. So part of me in terms of writing originally was more of as an escape, you know, as a therapy. So I kind of want to go in the opposite direction. only in the same thing, if I went to see a movie, I would not be a person to go see Romeo and Juliet because I deal with that all day long. So I would either go to something that was more entertaining with my kids or I would go watch like Arnold Schwarzenegger kick some ass because I <laughs> get you um, off the Mars. <laughs> so, okay. so that's so, reading. Right. It depends. If you're reading and writing as an escape, you tend to go a little bit different than what you do during the day. So okay. for me, I guess the reason why I went that way. Okay. So I actually, believe it or not, I actually wrote a short story trilogy. This is across three books with collections. With my, I did this with my kids when they were only seven and eight years old, set entirely in Cape May. Uh, for those of you who don't know, that's the southern tip of New Jersey, beach towns, where we vacation every summer. And mine actually was a sci-fi adventure for tweens. Um, there's something sort of magical about writing stories set in a be- uh, mystery set in a beach town because you're bringing mystery and danger to a setting that's away from the urban grit, right? So that that juxtaposition almost builds or tension organically, right? Is, is, sure. is that how it is for you? No, I believe so. I, I mean, I think when, as a reader, when I read, a lot of what I like to read is location, 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 right? So when I read and I escape, I want to escape to someplace I want to be, all right? So I think that's a big part of it. There's always, always been a draw to the ocean for many people because it, it's away from their usual life, their usual problems. There's something magical, you know, you sit in front of the ocean and it minimizes everything in your life, you know, down to manageable you know it kind of it kind of resets your perspective but then there's always something so interesting especially if you were a scooby-doo fan for instance right there was always that that uh, ghostly carousel you know near the ocean there's always um things that made that so much more interesting right think about all those houses in cape may those big beautiful victorian houses and what ghost stories could well, I actually, a few years ago, my wife and I actually took the Kate May, uh, the, 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 go, the ghost tour, 
Sure. Yeah. Think about all that bootlegging and pirating and smuggling. And, you know, we all love to hear about pirates and so much has happened really on our shores. I mean, it amazed me. I was researching for one of my books, the number of shipwrecks off the coast of New Jersey. I was floored because, you know, we kind of think, you know, 300 years ago, there was nothing. And then here we are, right? But what went on then, shipwrecks and all, it's amazing. And it's always interesting. Yeah. And actually in Cape, I don't know if you know the spot. So in Cape May, there's a spot called Sunset Beach right? Mm -hmm. every year. And it's a great place to see the sunset. And just off the water, sticking out of the water is the tip of a sunken ship. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so can you imagine, you know, try to think, but I would love to be honest, you know, with terms of sci-fi, what I would love to one day have is a time machine. I would love to go 50 years back, then a hundred years back, 50 years ahead. You know, just just like Time Machine, H.G. Wells. I mean, I think that would have been like a fascinating concept to see all these places and areas. For sure. So let me ask, so, and you touched upon a little bit. So much like with urban crime fiction, where, you know, the, the grit and the grime and the shadows are like, a, are almost like um, another character. Do you consider the beach setting almost like another character for you? I do. Absolutely. I think, I think it definitely plays in as another character because it's a whole different, it's a whole different feel, you know, as to what goes on and yet that water's there. You think about, you know, drowning instead of grit, grime and shadows, there's a lot of other things that are there. Um, when I was young, I think one of the things that drew me into the beach thing was remember the show, the ghost of Mrs. Muir. Sure. <laughs> Remember, so you have the ghost over, there always seems to be ghosts overlooking the ocean, right? There's always the ghosts of those lost at sea and those waiting for those lost at sea. And, and the lighthouse. Yeah, lighthouses especially, you know? Um, so yes, I do believe it's a whole different character. And I think it's, I, I think that really sets the scene. If you took the same story in a, in a city versus in the beach, I think it would be very different. So are you more interested in telling a good mystery or focusing on character? I'm absolutely character driven. Absolutely character driven. I mean, um, much again, the same way that you might have a murder she wrote, you know, you have a story and you'll have the end of that story, but you always have your larger story arc, which involves around your characters. And that's one of the biggest things that I, I, I think it's very important to deal with your characters because when I finish a good book, you know, and I really got invested in the characters in that book, you know, at the end of the next day when I don't have the books done, but I might say, gee, I wonder what they'd be up to that day in that town and what those people are doing. They mm -hmm. solve that mystery, but what else is going on? So I, I really believe that the because I tend to write the series, right? And it's all character driven. Okay. All right. So quick interlude for folks who came in a little late. If you have any questions or comments for Linda or me, send them in the chat box and we'll get to a few at the end of the show. All right, Linda. So you've got some. You've got some books. Let me. I'm going to share my screen here, and uh, let's see what uh, what you have to uh, what you have to show us. Give me one second here. All right. I'm going to click the old thing here, and we're going to do this and share. And all right. All right. Here we go. So what what are we looking at here? Misty Matter is my first book in uh, the Misty Point Mystery Series. So Misty Matter. It's funny because that's where again I you know, coordinated my healthcare and uh, my mystery series. But we have a young woman, Megan Stanford, who basically was in Detroit. She was uh, a journalist who wound up actually getting fired. But at the same time, her father called her and asked her to come back to New Jersey. It was three years after um, Hurricane Sandy. Her mom was in, these house, in this house by herself and kind of neglected. So she had to go back to take care of her grandmother. Um, and a lot of that was based on experience after Hurricane Sandy. I mean, I was one of those people that dodged the police barriers the day after the hurricane. I was down on the beach taking pictures. And it's true, that day, like the skies were gorgeous. But anyway, in this particular book, she goes home and there were some beach cottages behind the house. And some of them were dilapidated and dangerous. The town sued to get them taken down. And of course, when they started taking them down, they find a skeleton a body and the whole mystery is about how it got there when it got there who knew it was there who tried to hide it um and they start unraveling some 60 year old secrets in the house and uh finding out what's going on so who so are your in the misty manner is in your series is there 
Um, is each book a standalone or is there a central character throughout all the books? The central character is Megan Stanford. And so she goes home to take care of her grandmother, Rose. And uh, then she develops a love interest, somebody who, um, you know, she had known in high school. She has a couple of friends from high school. So each book, like a murder she wrote series, ends that particular mystery. But you have your group that are still having mysteries and things that happen in each book. So your lead character, so like, what is she uh, a cop? Is she uh, an investigator? Or she's just a person who happens to find herself in the middle of this kind of crazy situations? She was an investigative journalist from Detroit who right. came home, found yeah, herself yeah. in the middle of this. Um, again, of course, the guy she's dating is a cop. You know, you always have to have somebody official on board. Of course. And, and same thing, she's still trying to now that she's back at the house as an adult and she's digging around the attic and she's digging around, she's finding all these secrets. Uh -huh. It just so happens that, you know, they started the town. Her great grandfather was a wealthy sea captain who had gotten money because he had made some trans voyages from people from Philadelphia. So what happens is they own over 50 percent of the town and uh, are involved in a lot of different things. So as she starts to look at things as an adult. There's a lot of different places where there's a lot of secrets kept in town that they can uh, start finding out about. All right, great. And you said that there's five, there's five in the series, correct? Yes, currently, yes. There's five in the series. All mm -hmm. right, all right, great. So, all right, I'm gonna X out of this for a second. Give me, all sure. right, here we go. Okay, so that was great. Um, and we, we'd like to go on, but it's time, as we always do, to spin the spin the wheel. On the wheel are seven possible categories. Whatever, wherever it lands is what you get. And the categories are si Silence of the Lambs, Stranger in a Strange Land, Fear of Flying, Play It Again, Sam, Cold Case, Trick or Treat, and our newest our newest entry, uh, Kick Him in the Jump. All right, you ready? Okay. There we go. Whatever you get, that's what we play. This makes me a little nervous, but All okay. Right. Yeah, I think you can handle it. And we, what do we got? We got kick him in the junk all right all right so you can travel to any point in time and space and without repercussions you can kick someone in the junk who would it be oh wow well i mean i would have to uh i'd probably have to go and kick somebody in the junk that's involved in uh like mass uh mass casualty and killings and things like that you know all right take it take a mass shooter and just hit yeah him, hit him where it hurts all right yeah. all right exactly. Fair enough. All right, Linda, so you and I are both in the writing business, so let's go to our advice column. What's the, sure. best, and, what's the best and worst writing advice someone ever gave you? Well, let's see. In terms of marketing advice, what somebody told me is if you want to sell a book, write a second book, write another book. Because, um, you know, obviously, you have to obviously know what you're writing. You have to write a good book. You have to have a good product. You have to edit and whatnot. But if you want to, that, that's the best thing. Somebody from Penguin actually told me, you want to sell a book, write another book. The minute you finish your book and it's really done and you're going out and doing a query and stuff, that day you should be sitting down and starting the next one, you know, because it takes so much time to bring things to market and to do things. Don't wait, just, just keep right on going, keep writing. And the more you write, your skill does develop. So for sure. What about, what about the worst? The worst advice probably some, well, actually what happened is early on, <laughs> I had an editor that was looking over my very original work and, you know, he's like, you know, the first thing he said, I, we just meet, you know, he barely even looked at the pages. He goes, you know, you'll probably never publish. No people don't publish. Like it was so discouraging for a new writer to hear that mm -hmm. no matter how much time and effort you spent, your whole career is doomed just because that's the nature of the game. <laughs> it's like, wow, you know, like, you know, there always should be hope for everyone in every situation because, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. So he just said, well, you, you know, you might as well not waste time. You're probably never going to get published. Well, that's a lot. So, that was horrible. Yeah. Maybe you should have kicked him. Maybe you should have kicked him in the junk. Him in the junk. Yeah. Right. All, all right. So, all right. So now we're going to discuss if you have thick skin as writers, uh -oh. when we put our work and ourselves out there, criticism of all kinds comes with it. The good, the bad, and everything in between. So how do you feel about reviews? Do you take them to heart? Do you let them roll off you? Or do some stick with you more than others? Some stick with me more than others. I try to, I, I, I don't read every single review, to be honest, it depends. Um, a lot of times reviews come from somebody else's perspective, right? 
So for instance, somebody loves a particular genre, they may not like your genre, you know? If the review, the bad review is not always necessarily about your writing, your style, your technique. So it all comes, you have to take it all into perspective as to where it even comes from. Some reviews give you some actual, and I was told this too, read, read your reviews because there may be something that can help you, you know? So there have been reviews I've read where they've said, well, um, you know, this character, I would have thought they would have done this. And I'm thinking, gee, you know, you're right. Why, why didn't I do that? You know? Um, so I would say some I take seriously, some depending, you know, have, I'm, I don't know if you've ever had a review, Russ, where somebody says, I'm giving this book one star because the cover was bent when I got it, you know? And <laughs> yeah. what, are you, what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that kind of stuff is just, to me, it's just sort of nonsensical, you know, either judge, judge right. the work or don't, but I've had stuff where, you know, the cover was this, or the shipping was late, as if that has anything to do with what I what words are on the page. But right, well, that's yeah. people, that's people for you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right, so we've got a few minutes, so let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about that we didn't get to yet. So you were the president of Sisters in Crime. Um, so tell us a little bit about what that organization is and kind of what it does did it for you and what it can potentially do for other uh, writers who are interested in crime and mystery fiction. Sure. So Sisters in Crime was actually started in 1986 and uh, at a Boucheron conference, which was one of the largest mystery conferences, you know, every year that is held, Sarah Paretsky and 29 other women uh, got together and formulated the original Sisters in Crime. And at the time it was for, um, for support from other writers, but it, part of it was also so that women writers would be recognized as equal to male writers. There's many women who wrote for many years who actually had to submit their work as a man in order to be considered seriously. Right. So now it's time for them to get together, to support each other, to have equality in writing. And um, from 1986 on now, that has risen to an international um, organization. We now have uh, chapters that are even outside the United States. So what happens is that, um, you know, it, it, and it's open to everybody. Sisters in Crime, their um, thought is total inclusivity. So, you know, there's men, there's women, uh, there is the, it is not restricted to anybody anymore, any ages, anything. So what happens is that um, it's, it's a situation where you can join national, you can join a chapter, you can join Guppies, which is for new writers online. We have virtual chapters. Since COVID, we don't have as many in-person meetings. We've been doing a lot online on platform, but it's there for you to learn. It's there for people to help that who have been there to help guide you, to help uh, give you a lot of advice. Some of the conferences are phenomenal. When you go to the panels, you learn a lot on uh, publishing and what to do and sometimes what not to do. And from all aspects, from writing to editing, to marketing, um, all types of things. So uh, it's, it's all about support, encouragement, uh, advice, learning, teaching, it's great. Great, so one of the questions that, that came in uh, since we are talking about cozy mysteries at the beach, the question is why are people generally drawn to the ocean? I think because it's a place of healing. I think people feel more relaxed at the ocean. And like I said, there's a lot of people with problems that when you go and you look at the vastness of the ocean, you honestly feel things minimized, you know, things don't seem as bad when you're at the ocean, you're maybe just because you're away, you know, I mean, a lot of people look at the sun and the sea and, and now we've proven scientifically that the sun gives us vitamin D, which helps our immune system, which helps prevent, you know, prevent other diseases. So, um, you know, I do believe that uh, there's actually healing properties at the sea. I think Garth Brooks wrote a very good song about, uh, <laughs> getting drunk and healing at the sea as well for heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right, this one comes from our friend Carol Gazander. Linda, what do you recommend for reviewing or beta reading your novels when you're done with, when you're done writing? I personally have a group of beta readers and it's very interesting because I will send it out to my group um, and it's a mixed group of people that over the years have, have come to me for various reasons. And if I have 10 beta readers on a book, every single one of them will come back to me with different thoughts, different concepts, and they'll find different problems. Anything from spelling to even 
plot points in the book. You know, I, I, there was one book I had a character doing something and, and they came back to me and said, no, this character would not have done this. It's out of character. So I have a group of dedicated beta readers who um, read my books and I have to tell you, they are so helpful. They really are. So I would, I would try to develop that. I don't know if you want to include that in your street team or people who only save their street teams for marketing, but I certainly would, um, I would develop a group of beta readers that are kind of always there and ready and waiting. You yeah, know, so I, actually, Carol just, she actually beat me to it. I had a follow-up question. So um, about how long do you, is, is your, the turnaround time between you give them the manuscript and they get back their notes back to you? Uh, for the most part, honestly, they usually all have it back to me within two weeks at the latest, um, you know, because I'll give it to them. They all read different forms. And it's funny because, you know, when you actually read it on paper versus when you um, read it as an ebook or read it even in a PDF format uh, versus one, one piece of advice I was always given um, when, you, when you yourself even read it aloud or some people will read parts of it aloud the same way when you go into a group and, you know, you read part, you do your reading out loud, you have a whole different perspective on your reading. So that's another reason probably why everybody gives me different you know feedback and it's all invaluable honestly but so, for the most part uh, it's two weeks i would say <clears throat> wow and that's i mean that's that's a fast turnaround for a, a manuscript that could be 80 or ninety thousand words um, sure. um okay um just one last question on that because i talk about this kind of thing all the time so 10 is a lot that's a lot of different voices coming in is do you find that it just sometimes it's just it's too many or is it is that, is that just that the right number for you? I think it's the right number for me. Um, I, I don't want to limit it just to one or two people. And they are people that I know well. And they come from different walks of life, which I think is important because they have different perspectives. So mm -hmm. I have people that, you know, were professional secretaries. I have people who were in volunteer management capacities. I have people who um, are clinicians. And um, they all, you know, the people that are clinicians or in the health field will pick up different things about the health part. Like in part of my books, I walk people through autopsies and through hospital stuff, right? So they'll concentrate on some of those details, you know, more so. Whereas somebody who is a professional secretary will look at maybe editing and writing more, you know, whereas somebody who uh, was in volunteer will, will be more attracted to the, um, the heart spots of the book you know so uh i think that's important too you want to have diversity in who's reading your books sure all right all right so linda so that was great um so we talked about your book i'm gonna bring i'm gonna share my screen one more time as we as we kind of get to the end here hang on just bear with me one minute and hold on let me go back here and where are we there we go and share and Okay, so um, we talked about Misty Manor. What's next for you? I'm actually writing the sixth book in the Misty Point mystery series, but I also have plans. I have actually a standalone book that came out in 2019, which is a paranormal book. So I have some plans about that one that I want to continue. And I actually want to go back to my first series as well. I have, I have some follow-up on that I'd like to do. All right, great. And where can we... And the big thing, um, I have my uh, my Misty Matter audiobook is coming out. Oh, very exciting! Um, yeah, so I have audiobooks that are starting to come out as well. And when will when will we be able to get those? Well, the first the first the audiobook for Misty Matter I think should be out within a couple of weeks at the latest. So I'm excited about that. Oh, great! All right, and where can we get and where where can folks find your books? You all the usual places. Yeah, online, um, online at Target and Walmart and Amazon and Barnes and Noble and, you know, all those places. Yeah. So uh, definitely shop online. All right. Thanks, Linda. That's those, uh, all that stuff sounds great. So as for me, if you're up for a little Blade Runner style sci-fi with your crime and mystery, I'll encourage you to check out my sci-fi noir, Crackling Fire, featuring my hard-boiled intergalactic private eye, Angela Hardwick, who is hired to find a missing intern with stolen corporate files, but soon finds herself tackling with dueling gangsters, hostile protesters, and a madman from Earth with galactic ambitions of his own. Crackling Fire is about, available on Amazon and published by Crazy Eight Press. And the follow-up to Crackling Fire will be out this September. Title and cover reveals coming 
next week. So look out for that. And I start writing the third book uh, pretty soon. All right. Thank you, Linda, um, for coming on to the show. It was great as always. Um, this has been a great hour. And I want to thank everyone who's at home watching. I've only got two more shows for the rest of the summer before I take a break. So be sure to check them out and visit my YouTube channel for any interviews um, that you may have missed. Uh, hang on, am I still, am I still sharing my screen here? I think yes. I am. I got an X out of this. Uh, hang on, bear with me. There we go. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so I've only got two more shows for the rest of the summer. Check them out. Visit my YouTube channel for any things that you may have missed. Uh, thanks again to Linda and to everyone who's watching at home. And I'll see you all next week. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. All uh, right. Thank Take care, guys. Oh, uh, thank you.